Matthew chapter 18, beginning with verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. How many of you have Bibles that say 77 times? How many of you have 70 times seven? Okay. Let me explain that discrepancy to you. There are some manuscripts that say 77 and some that say 70 times 7. That's the kind of thing that happens when you copy a document by hand. Okay? Now, I, say, I tell you that. Let me just preach a sermon here before I preach the sermon. How many of you have ever heard there are hundreds of mistakes in the manuscripts? You ever heard something like that? Well, listen, when a word is misspelled, they count that as a, a mistake. If one manuscript says 77 and the other one says 70 times 7, they count every manuscript that is different as a mistake. So when you hear hundreds, that means everyone who followed this mistake and recopied it, that counts as one. There is not one single verse of Scripture, not one single doctrine that is in doubt because of a manuscript issue. The Bible is the most well-attested book of antiquity. We have more manuscripts in more agreement than any book of history. If you want to throw the Bible out because of manuscript supposed discrepancies, you've got to throw out everything we know about ancient history because nothing is as well-attested as the Bible. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. It doesn't really matter, does it? 70 times or 70 times 7 or 77 times. Verse 23, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to sell accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man was, who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we are constantly amazed at the depth of your forgiveness. And oftentimes we are amazed at the shallowness of our own. Father, teach us today the importance of forgiveness. It's in the name of Christ who died that we might be forgiven that we ask it. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, we're told to see to it that no root of bitterness grows up to cause trouble and defile many. The author of Hebrews there speaks of bitterness as a noxious weed, a weed that grows up and defiles not just the one in whom it's growing, but defiles many. It defiles not only the person who harbors the bitterness, but it defiles those around the person who harbors the bitterness. Bitterness is a weed that can strangle the spiritual life and the usefulness of even the most committed of Christians. And I would say to you that without any doubt, some of the most spiritually stunted, emotionally hindered, and sometimes even physically crippled people I have ever known are people who are holding a grudge, people who can't get over something, people who won't forgive some slight or some wrong that's been done to them. Jesus taught often the importance of forgiving others, but nowhere, I think, more powerfully 
that in these verses and in this parable, there's much in this passage that we need to understand about forgiveness, both the forgiveness we have received and also the forgiveness we're called to extend to others. So as we begin looking at the passage in verses 21 to 22, we kind of have the setup for the parable. And in those verses, we see the problem of Peter. Peter came to Jesus to ask him, how many times should I forgive? Jesus had been talking about forgiveness. Well, Peter wants to know, okay, I understand this forgiveness stuff, but what's the limit? There's got to be a limit. How many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? I entitled this point, The Problem of Peter. I really should have entitled it The Problems, plural, of Peter because it, it, even in the way he phrased the question, there are at least three problems we see that he's dealing with. Number one, there's a problem of inaccurate perspective. Notice how Peter says it here. He says, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? What's his perspective? My brother sinning against me. It's against me. He's done something to me. It's an inaccurate perspective. He's looking at it from the perspective of sin being against him, not from the perspective of sin being against God. In Psalm 51, we have David's great prayer of confession after his great sin with Bathsheba of adultery and then arranging to have her husband killed. And in verse 4 of that psalm, David says to God, against you, you only have I sinned. And I used to read that and I would get angry. I would argue with David. I would read that and say, David, what are you talking about against God only you've sinned? What about Bathsheba? What about Uriah hacked to pieces on the battlefield? You, you have surely sinned against more than just God. I thought David had far too small a view of his own sin. But over time, I came to realize it was not David who had all too small a view of sin. I had too small a view of sin. See, David understood that ultimately all sin is first, foremost, and preeminently against God because God alone is holy. As much as his sins had hurt others, and they definitely had, when he considered how much they had offended the holiness of God, the human impact of the sin faded almost to insignificance. Consider this, when someone does you wrong and it really hurts, and you're really offended, consider that that hurt and offense you feel is not even a fraction of what God feels over it. That sin may have affected us. That sin may have impacted us. That sin may have devastated us. But ultimately, it was not against us. It was against God. As long as we come at it from the perspective of, look what they did to me. How dare they do that to me? We'll struggle with forgiveness. But when we begin to see that what they did was primarily against God, and when we recognize that if we handle it badly, if we respond wrongly, we too are going to be heaping hurt on God, that will go a long way toward helping us to forgive. Peter had a problem of inaccurate perspective. Secondly, he had a problem with inordinate pride. Peter was willing to forgive seven times. And he no doubt thought that was pretty good, considering that the rabbis taught their disciples to forgive three times. And he undoubtedly thought that by suggesting seven, Jesus would commend him. How magnanimous you are, Peter. How spiritual you are. Twice as much as expected with one more for good measure. But then Jesus took the wind right out of his sails. No, Peter, not seven times. More like 70 times seven times. And that brings us to the third problem that Peter had, and that's a problem with incomplete pardon. Pardon. 
See, when Jesus said we're to forgive 70 times, seven times, he didn't mean that we're to tally mark off 490 times and on the 491st time, we're to poke the guy in the nose. And there's some people that are just vindictive enough to count off 490 times. That's not what Jesus was talking about. What Jesus was saying is, Peter, if you're counting, you're not really forgiving. Because true forgiveness takes away all of the anger, all of the bitterness, all of the desire for revenge. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love keeps what record of wrongs? No record of wrongs. What Peter wanted to do, he wanted to hold on to one-seventh of the bitterness of each offense. Just enough to keep a record of it. And then after seven times, he thought he'd be justified to stop forgiving and to seek revenge. But true forgiveness always issues in a full pardon, not a partial, incomplete problem. So we see the problem of Peter. And that brings us to the parable of Jesus. The parable of Jesus. To to illustrate the importance of forgiveness, Jesus told a story about a man who owed a king 10,000 talents. It was a humongous debt, a debt he could not possibly pay. So the king ordered the man and his family sold into slavery and all of his goods liquidated in order to recoup part of this debt. See, in the ancient world, for smaller debts, a person might be thrown into debtor's prison. Usually didn't happen. After all, if you're in prison, you can't very well work and you can't very well repay the debt. So usually the creditor would just extend the time and add on some interest because there wasn't any real point in throwing somebody in jail. Usually jail was reserved for those who just adamantly refused to pay. Or sometimes jail was used just because the the creditor was just pure mean. But for larger debts, the person's assets, including himself and his family, would be sold. And this was indeed a larger debt. Even with all that, even selling the man and his family into slavery, even liquidating all of his assets, the king could never hope to recoup this vast amount of money. And so the debtor begged the king for patience. He said, if you just give me time, I'll repay it. He may have been sincere in thinking he could repay it, but the fact of the matter is there was no way he could ever repay that large amount of money. You see, one talent represents about 15 years of labor. He owed 10,000 talents. That means he owed the king 45 million days wages. It would have taken him 150,000 years to pay off that amount of money. It was an absolute hopeless case. But the king had compassion on him. And he completely canceled the debt. He took the financial hit himself and let the man go free. Then verse 28 says that this man went out after being relieved of all that debt and he found a fellow servant who owed him a trifling amount of money in comparison. The the other servant owed him about 100 days wages. And the fellow servant responded exactly as he had. He fell on his knees. He said, give me more time and I'll repay you. This was a reasonable request. After all, there's far more chance of someone repaying 100 days' wages rather than 45 million days' wages. But we're told that he had no compassion on his fellow servant. He grabbed him by the throat. He refused to forgive as he had been forgiven. He vindictively threw the man into debtor's prison. And our reaction to that is... Exactly what the reaction was of the other servants and the king in the story. What inexcusable wickedness. To have been forgiven so much and to be willing to forgive so little. To have been forgiven 45 million days wages. But then to refuse to extend forgiveness or even patience for a measly hundred days wages. I think the point of the parable is fairly obvious. 
Like the man in the parable, we too owed a sin debt that we couldn't possibly pay. The penalty for even one of our sins was enough to send us to hell for all eternity. And every one of us has committed thousands of sins. There was no amount of religious ritual or no amount of self-reform and no amount of good works we could have ever do in a thousand lifetimes that would have repaid that debt. But God in His mercy because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross freely forgave us when we came to Him in repentance and faith, surrendering our lives to Him. He took the hit Himself. He paid the penalty for us so that we could go free. And in light of how much we've been forgiven, it is inexcusably wicked for us to refuse to forgive others. Because whatever they've done to us, it pales in comparison to what our sins did to Christ. So we see the parable of Jesus, and as the parable continues, we see the pain of bitterness in verses 31 to 34. When the king heard about how the man had treated his fellow servant, he was angry and he threw him into prison. Verse 35 says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. These are words that have been greatly misunderstood and greatly misinterpreted. Some people read that and say, see, if a Christian refuses to forgive, then God strips him of his salvation and sends him to hell. Well, there are at least three reasons I know of why that interpretation is wrong. First and foremost, it invo involves an improper view of salvation. See, when Jesus saved us, he saved us from all of our sins, past sins, present sins, future sins. He gave us eternal life. Not revocable life. Not probationary life, but eternal life. And eternal life, by its very definition, has to be eternal. Jesus said, I give to them eternal life. Present tense, not future tense. He doesn't say, I will maybe give to them eternal life. He says, I give to them eternal life in the here and now. At the moment you receive Christ, you received eternal life. And Jesus said, I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish. Listen, if even one person who's ever had eternal life perishes, the Son of God is a liar. Because he said those he gives eternal life to will never perish. Number two, that interpretation can't be right. Because it presses the details of the parable beyond their proper limits. Understand, this is not an allegory, this is a parable. What, you say, what's the difference? In an allegory, every detail of the story has some symbolic significance. A parable is a vehicle used to teach one major lesson. In this case, the lesson is the importance of forgiveness. The details are just for the purpose of telling the story and don't always have symbolic meaning at all. Third, as we look at the story, it's not at all certain he was thrown in jail for the old debt. As a matter of fact, the king says again in verse 32 that the old debt was forgiven. And if it, he was reinstating that debt, it would seem that the original penalty of being sold would have come into play, not being thrown into debtor's prison, which was for smaller debts. No, this was a smaller debt. This was a debt incurred because of his treatment of the other servants. This was a, a fine, if you will. But by throwing the man into prison, obviously he would have no ability to pay the fine. And therefore the king's action was in effect a life sentence. I would say to you this morning, there are thousands of Christians who are serving a life sentence today. Perhaps some within this very room. They're imprisoned by bitterness. They're tormented by old memories and thoughts of revenge. They're cut off from fellowship with God. And ultimately, they are utterly useless to the kingdom of God. See, lack of forgiveness, like any other sin we might commit as Christians, does not remove us from relationship with God. We're still His children. He's still our Father. But it does break our fellowship with Him. 
It does cut us off from fellowship with him. And as long as we walk in that bitterness, our fellowship will remain broken and we'll live in the misery of bitterness. Cut off from most of the blessings of being a Christian. Someone put it very well when they said, forgiveness is opening a door to let the prisoner go free and discovering that the prisoner was you. The pain of bitterness. One last point, point. that's the principle of forgiveness. Again, verse 35, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. There are three quick points that need to be made about forgiveness. I thought there were two, but one of them came up after I finished the sermon. Number one, true forgiveness is not just external. Jesus said we must forgive from the heart. We can tell somebody I forgive you and act like nothing's wrong and still inside we're seething. Still inside we're harboring thoughts of bitterness. Still inside we're, we're fantasizing revenge. Still inside we have malice toward the other person wishing them evil. I will never forget watching a TV special one time where they brought together the two figure skaters, Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan. You remember the story? Tanya Harding's bodyguard had taken a club and clubbed Nancy Kerrigan in the knee about three or four weeks before the Olympics to try to put her out so the other girl could have a better chance. And after it all kind of, all the legal stuff kind of settled down, they brought the two girls together in the TV studio. And Tanya Harding looked at Nancy Kerrigan and said, will you forgive me? And she said, yeah, I'll forgive you. Her eyes were glaring. Her lips were pulled back. Her arms were crossed across her. Every aspect of her tone and every aspect of her body language said, if they just turned these cameras off, I'd rip your lungs out with my bare hands. It doesn't matter how many times she says, I forgive you, she didn't forgive. That's not real forgiveness. Real forgiveness is from the heart. Real forgiveness must be external, not just, or internal, not just external. Number two, and this is huge, true forgiveness is an act of the will. When Jesus said, you must forgive your brother from the heart, we think of the heart as the seat of the emotions. But that was not the case in the ancient world. The Greeks thought of the heart as the seat of the will. The, the seat of decision-making. True forgiveness is a decision we make. Listen, if you're, just wait, if you're waiting for some wonderful feeling, some emotional wave of forgiveness to just wash over you, you will never forgive. Forgiveness is, a, is not a feeling, it's an act of the will. We choose to forgive out of obedience to God's command, not because we feel like forgiving but because God commands it and we're obedient. But listen, when we truly forgive, feelings follow. This is how we operate. We want the feelings to come and then the action to come. Listen, we, we operate just the opposite. When we we'll obey and we act, then the feelings will come. So number two, true forgiveness is an act of will. Number three, Forgiveness is a decision you make today that will be challenged tomorrow and will have to be reiterated tomorrow. Anybody remember the old song, There's Always Something There to Remind Me? And I can guarantee you, if you forgive somebody today, something's going to come up. To, it may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week. It may be a month from now. But something in your future is going to come up that's going to remind you of that offense. It's going to remind you of what those people did. It's going to remind you of what they said. It's going to come up again in your mind. And all of that bitterness is going to start to rise in you. And at that point, you have a decision to make of whether you're going to revoke that forgiveness or whether you're going to reiterate that forgiveness. Can I just tell you that this week in preparing to preach this sermon, I've had to relive every insult ever thrown my direction. 
every betrayal I've ever experienced, every wrong that's ever been done to me. The devil threw everything that's ever happened to me back in my face again, and I had to forgive it all again. I had to relive it all again, and then I had to forgive it all again. Forgiveness is a decision of the moment. You make that decision in a moment, but it's a decision that has to be constantly reiterated because there's always something there to remind you. Corrie ten Boom and her family were imprisoned during World War II by the Nazis at Ravensbrück concentration camp for the crime of harboring Jews in Amsterdam from the Nazi invasion forces. During that ordeal, Corrie alone survived. Her father and her sister both died in that concentration camp. She tells about years later speaking at a church in Munich and she had spoken on the subject of forgiveness. And after the service was over, people were coming by to greet her and speak to her. And she looked up and she saw a man in line to come speak to her. And she recognized that man as having been a guard at Ravensbrook. Obviously, there were hundreds of people at that concentration camp. He would never have remembered her, but she would never forget him. She would never forget his deliberate cruelties, his demonic sneer, and the lash of his leather whip. And as he made her, his way closer and closer to her, she began to fumble with her pocketbook, hoping he would get the hint and move on and not come over, but he did. He stuck his hand out. And he said to her that he had indeed been that guard at Ravensbrook. But since that time, he had become a Christian, and he said to her these words, I know that God has forgiven me, but will you forgive me? And she stood there for a long moment staring at that hand, and everything within her wanted to slap that hand away. Everything within her wanted to respond to that Request for forgiveness with bitter words and curse words. But she knew that forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a decision of the will. And so she reached out a trembling hand and she took him by the hand woodenly at first, but then with, with feeling. And she cried out, I do forgive you, brother, with all my heart. And the two of them embraced, both of them victims of Nazism. One of them a victim of Nazi ideology, the other a victim of Nazi brutality, but now both redeemed by the blood of Jesus. That one act of forgiveness set Corey Ten Boom free from any lingering bitterness, and she was able to serve her Lord effectively for many years until her death. Today, perhaps you're here and you're in bondage to bitterness. If that's so, you need to make the decision right now. The decision. You say, I don't feel anything. You're not going to feel anything until you make the decision. If you're waiting for feelings, feelings aren't going to come. It's a decision. It's a decision of the will. You've got to make that decision today to forgive and then you need to confess that sin of bitterness to God. You may need to go to somebody and ask for forgiveness. You may need to go to somebody and offer forgiveness. Perhaps today you're in bondage of another kind. It may be today that you're in bondage to sin. Jesus came and paid the high price of the cross of Calvary to to forgive that bondage to sin and to release our bondage to sin. He paid our penalty and took our place on the cross so that we might be forgiven if we'll just receive the forgiveness that He offers to us. If you've never received that gift of forgiveness and eternal life, He's calling you today. 
to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He's calling you today to turn from your sins and repentance, to place your faith in Him and what He did on the cross, to surrender your life to His Lordship and His control. Today, if you've never received Christ, today is the day. You need to pray and ask Him to come into your life. And then you need to step out and come forward publicly professing your faith in Christ. I'll be down front here to meet you. You just come forward and say, Brother Donnie, I've asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And I'll present you to the congregation and we'll celebrate that decision you've made and we'll set up a time when you can be baptized. Maybe today you're a child of God and you don't have a local church home. And the Lord is leading you to become a part of this fellowship. We invite you to come during the invitation time. It may be today that there's bitterness in your heart. And the Lord is calling you to forgive. The altar is open. I'll be down front to pray with you. You come today as the Lord leads. As we stand together and sing our invitation hymn.